Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 11th Index on Censorship Freedom of Expression Awards. Please take your seats. This evening's ceremony is about to commence. Please welcome your host for the night, the Chair of Index on Censorship, Jonathan Dimbleby. Good evening and welcome to the annual Index Freedom of Expression Awards. Uh, you will notice, those of you who have been to them before, that we've changed the format this year. Can't, that means I can't see some of you, but I, if you want to, you can see me. Um, uh, we haven't changed the purpose of the evening, uh, but the format has changed, essentially because we want to involve more people in these awards, and we didn't want to feel that anyone would be excluded um, by being priced out of here. And we've been rewarded by a record attendance. This is our 11th such ceremony, and it's the biggest. I hope that in a tight schedule, you will find this evening stimulating and enjoyable. There are some terrific speakers to come, the auction, um, and, of course, most important of all, the awards themselves. Um, do let us know, incidentally, afterwards whether you think it works for you. Uh, I'm asked to remind you to turn off your mobile phones, but feel free to tweet in the freedom of expression way. <laughs> and, and if you wish to tweet, how can we stop you in any case? Um, the hashtag is index awards. I, I hope it won't seem complacent of me. Um, to report that our profile nationally and internationally has grown dramatically as more and more individuals come to appreciate what I think is the unique role played by Index on many fronts, and which may explain why so many people are here this evening. I want, first of all, to thank some of those who've helped make this event possible. Among them, Google, whose enthusiasm for our work is a really great boon. The Guardian, the Economist Intelligent Life magazine, and Beinman's law firm. We are very grateful for their continuing support and their individual sponsorship of our awards. Index would not be where it is and would not get to where it wants to get without the commitment, the generosity, and the involvement of those who support and fund our work. We are very grateful to the institutional sponsors who are listed in the program, and they will forgive me if I don't mention them all by name. I also want to thank, on this occasion, Sage, our publishers. They have transformed our editorial profile over the little over a year that we joined forces. They are heavily involved in our growing online service and are strongly supporting our other work as well, not least as we expand what we're doing into the United States. And tonight, they are the generic sponsors of the Index Awards. This year, the cause of free expression has been at the forefront of world affairs. To a degree that I suspect no one imagined, dictators across the Middle East who suppressed free, expressor, free expression for generations and who prefer to torture and to murder rather than allow their critics to speak freely have themselves been on the rack, driven from power or confronting wave after wave of protest from those demanding this essential human right. We've seen brave young men and women, and some of their elders as well, taking to the streets, armed only with mobile phones and social networking sites. They demanded change, and at the heart of that, the freedom to express their hopes and aspirations without fear. Index has not only been telling that story, but we've done our best to facilitate the process, supporting, for instance, projects like Radio Kalima in Tunisia, training journalists in Yemen, and supporting the rights of journalists in Iraq to access information. Two previous winners of an Index on Censorship Freedom of Expression Award have been very often at the top of the news agenda this year, Twitter and WikiLeaks. Twitter has once again proved itself to be an extraordinarily important tool for the mobilization of opinion, and particularly, of course, of protest. It's been a crucial tool for those demanding change. It is almost now impossible to silence the voice of protest unless governments take the crass and ultimately self-defeating 
step of blocking access altogether to the internet. Egypt tried that. The first time that any state has taken quite such drastic action. But as you know, it didn't work. The internet had already provided the platform for dissidents in a flourishing blogosphere. YouTube disseminated videos of police brutality. It's impossible to exaggerate the importance of this new world of communication. As ancien regimes struggle and stumble and frequently tumble as they try to strangle freedom, the web and the mobile phone expose them to contempt and to ridicule. Tyranny is on the back foot as never before. Freedom of expression is more widely seen to be a sine qua non of a civilized 21st century society at the very heart of every freedom that humanity cherishes. And then there is WikiLeaks. Hard again to exaggerate the impact of WikiLeaks on the fight to hold states and governments to account through freedom of expression. Nor is WikiLeaks the only website of its kind. Regional and specialist whistleblower sites are fast emerging. Of course, WikiLeaks sparks debate, and Index is proud to have been and to be at the heart of this. Very important questions about individual safety, national security, confidentiality, and privacy are brought dramatically to the fore and into focus by the power of WikiLeaks and others to disseminate raw data from the very heart of government and other powerful or indeed less powerful institutions. For my part, believing as I do that freedom of expression is a defining characteristic of a free society, I think that these important, competing sometimes and conflicting sometimes rights have to be at the heart of the debate about freedom of expression. I'm therefore very glad that Index is planning to hold a series of debates and discussions to explore these precious issues. There are also major issues much closer to home. Index has been deeply immersed in the campaign to re reform our antiquated libel laws. Laws that have chilled the free speech of academics, of charities, of bloggers, and many others for far too long. I'm really proud that Index, at the helm, has been leading a broader campaign instrumental in changing the political climate that has resulted in the publication of the draft defamation bill. And in that context, I want to say to the Open Society Foundation a big thank you, not only for your core support, but for backing our libel reform campaign at a point when it seemed that David would never be able to fell Goliath. There are other emerging challenges. I'll give just one example, and I can give more. All mobile phone base stations now contain the inbuilt capacity to track every individual who has such a phone. The challenge that that poses to freedom of expression is self-evident, and it needs to be explored and challenged. I, 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 it will sound as if I have the temerity to say what I'm about to say, but I have it. It is only an organization like Index that can get across issues like this early, draw them to wider attention, and then lead the argument with expertise and measured confidence. I referred earlier to the, to the Arab world rising up against dictatorship. There is less good news from elsewhere. China and Burma continue to blacken their appalling reputations for denying free expression. Iran continues to execute those who try to use their right to free expression. More executions this year than last. An Iranian web designer is facing execution for, I quote, designing and moderating adult content websites, and, I quote again, agitation against the regime. Execution is his likely price if he is found guilty. In Belarus, the authorities have imprisoned 42 prisoners of conscience, many of them, of course, outspoken critics of the president, Lukashenko. In Azerbaijan, it's no better. The lawyer for Ainullah Fatulayev was a nominee at last year's Index Awards. It is now a year since the European Court of Human Rights ordered his release from jail. He is still there. His family have been told to shut up once and for all about his case, or, I quote, the entire family will be destroyed. And this, 
in a country which is a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. Of course, the challenges are not going to go away. They become more myriad and more complex. Freedom of expression in a variety of ways is imperiled everywhere. Eternal vigilance is required, constant attention, and a readiness to take up the cudgels to protect this fundamental human right. Next year, we, we celebrate our 40th anniversary, and we have a great deal planned for that year, which John Kampfner and Joe Glanville will tell us a little bit about later. Of course, since, as you will have imagined from what I've just said, since the Cold War, when we started, we have adapted and changed to meet new situations. The issues today uh, look, present themselves in some measure in black and white, but very often in gray as well. But we have never deviated from our core purpose to defend the principles and the practice of free expression everywhere. It's now my pleasure to introduce our partner in this process, Ziad Mara, who is the executive vice president of our publishers, Sage. Would you give him a warm welcome? Hi all. Um, I'm, uh, I'm told it's free expression, so I could say what on earth I like, but um, I'm hoping that um, I'll prove it wrong in a sec. I wanted to start by mentioning David Nutt. I know we've been talking about David Nutt for about two solid years, but people may not realize that when he um, published that now famous um, editorial comparing um, ecstasy and the dangers of ecstasy and um, uh, horse riding, it was uh, a, a sage journal the Journal of Psychopharmacology. And we at SAGE, when we watched the consequences of, of that small step that he took, that logically seeming, logical seeming step, where he generated a complete storm of, of um, uh, protest and uh, made some powerful enemies and eventually was sacked by Alan Johnson, the then um, Home Secretary. Um, we at SAGE were looking on aghast at this, as I'm sure pretty much everyone in this room was doing. It seemed like the moral of the story was that... Um, Speaking your mind is at least as dangerous as riding horses. So um, I was sort of wondering about other examples of, of um, infringements on academic freedom. And um, as it happens, was at a, um, at a memorial of a sage author only earlier today. And during one of the eulogies, um, heard an example that was very much like the David Nutt case. I'll just tell you about it very briefly. And, um, her name is Barbara Maines. She's an educational, was an educational psychologist, um, very passionate, very fearless speaker, um, who also was the co-founder of um, a, a technique for tackling bullying using the principles of restorative justice. Um, and she and her partner, George Robinson, um, were able very successfully to roll out um, a, a program that actually um, favored not punishing and not humiliating the bully, but actually doing more on um, uh, making the bully look at the victim and understand the, crime, the, the harm that they'd commit, created. Um, it was going very well. Local educational authorities started picking it up as their part of their anti-bullying policy until Tony Blair himself got wind of it and um, made a statement in the House of Commons which led to an, another firestorm um, the consequence of which was that um, the educational authority then had to reverse all its policies. So Bristol and Birmingham, both of them had to change all their policies. And then Barbara and George, the two co-authors, were both um, thrown out of the anti-bullying alliance um, at that time, um, despite the um, reactions of their supporters up and down the country, including the NSPCC and, and uh, Childline. Uh, it was covered a lot at the time. But anyway, it's just a very strange coincidence to have heard about that story again um, only earlier today. Those are two authors that we, Sage, want to disseminate. We obviously have thousands of authors and editors and believe deeply in the importance of disseminating their ideas and believing that if their ideas can, be, um, can reach their audiences untrammeled, it'll be better for the world, it'll be better for society, and we'll, we'll, um, um, uh, you know, I think we all in this room agree with that principle. And it's in that context that we at Sage have designated 2011 to be the year of the author. So um, we're focused on various events to try and promote authorship, none of which are more important than this one tonight. Um, this um, sponsoring the um, Index of Censorship Freedom of Expression Awards has been um, the kind of highlight for us in a whole sequence of, um, 
um, of plans to um, support authorship around the world. And we're very, very proud that we publish the magazine. It's incredibly important to us that we do. Um, I should just mention to you that the um, subscriptions that you, you, I don't know if you're aware, but you'll actually have a subscription. And, and in virtue of having joined this evening tonight, built into your attendance is actually a price of a, a digital subscription. You just have to come to the stand and give us your details to actually switch that on. But I do recommend you look at the issues and look at the, the sheer um, quality and skill that Joe Glanville and her team bring to actually each of the issues of the, uh, of the magazine. I'll just finish by, by saying how much we valued our relationship with Index in general terms. We, we um, do find everyone at Index to be a, con a constant source of real inspiration. Um, uh, John Kampfner is a particularly dynamic and um, um, indefat indefatigable um, partner, and uh, it's very hard to keep up with him, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but the organization as a whole, I think, is filled with dynamic, motivated, incredibly effective people providing intelligent commentary on complex issues, but also revealing themselves to be phenomenally effective campaigners um, and have very, very strongly taken the lead in changing um, the uh, likely outcome for English um, libel law. And that's no mean feat, and actually a consequence of which will mean that authors and we publishers will be able to publish um, and uh, a little more fearlessly in the future. So I actually think we should give Index a round of applause for that. <clears throat> and I'll hand back to Jonathan. Ziad, thank you very much, and we mutually cherish the relationship. Um, come now to our next speaker, who is a novelist. Uh, he writes a weekly column in The Independent, and he is a broadcaster as well. He's written 11 novels. Um, he, he's been described by one smart wit as the English Philip Roth, to which he replies, being an even smarter wit, that he prefer to be described as the Jewish Jane Austen. <laughs> um, you know who I'm talking about? Um, his, his book, The Findler Question, won the Man Booker Prize 2010, and he told me this evening, just containing that delight that this means to anyone who uh, says anything in writing, that it has so far around the world sold no less than 500,000 copies in the English language, and is being translated into 23 or 24 other languages as well. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce as our keynote speaker tonight, Howard Jacobson. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time I attended this event, it was a sit-down dinner. When I was invited to give this address, I assumed, <laughs> I think reasonably, that it would be a sit-down dinner. This is not a complaint. I'm not saying you got me here under false pretenses. But I am starting to wonder whether I am the reason this is not a sit-down dinner. Either someone saw me eat the last time and doesn't want to see me eat again, or it was thought I'd make dietary stipulations it would be beyond your ingenuity or finances to honor. These days, for some reason, every time I'm asked to make an after-dinner speech, which this isn't, because there is no... <laughs> I am also asked where I stand in the matter of pig. In fact, the book of Leviticus comes down as hard against lapwig, lapwing, chameleon and tortoise as it does against pig. Yet no one ever writes to check where I stand on chameleon. <laughs> Only ever pig. Do people hear my name and automatically conjure up pig? Anybody would think I'm a banker. <laughs> Though if any of you are thinking of calling me a banker, be warned that I'll be taking out a super injunction. I like this idea of getting the law to stop people calling you what you are. <laughs> Call me a comic novelist again and I'll see you in court. <laughs> Does it then follow that we can get the courts to call us what we aren't? 
I've always fancied being described as a great Christian thinker and humanitarian. <laughs> a great, tall Christian thinker and humanitarian. <laughs> Wise beyond my years, beautiful beyond the power of words to describe, and wonderfully lacking in neurosis when it comes to what I eat. Can I sue whoever refers to me in any other terms? Can I sue anyone who refers to me at all? Can I take out an injunction against any person who claims to know me, to see me, to have seen me, or to be aware of my existence? Can I take out an injunction against the promulgation of the idea that I exist? I feel a novel coming on. The story, the story of a man who goes to law to prevent anyone putting him into words. Words, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just writers who are the enemy now. It's language itself. We should be flattered, we who deal in language. Clearly, we wield greater power than we know. Our criticism stings. Our derision maddens. Our sacred calling to hold nothing sacred is under threat. It is always under threat. But every time a court attempts to gag us or come to that, the court of easily swayed public opinion attempts to gag us. Someone's hurt feelings, someone's outraged sensibility, someone who is offended as though the fact of being offended somehow confers the right not to be. Every time the state steps in to have us silenced, as in the case of some of those we honour tonight, in comparison to whom, let's face it, most of us live the life of Riley. Every time someone would have us silenced, the power we possess is acknowledged. For our part, we who possess that power, we must not exempt ourselves from the universality of our scorn. If nothing is sacred, then we aren't sacred either, nor by the same logic is any principle. Objection, evasion, cheerful mistrust, delighted mockery, Nietzsche wrote, are signs of health. Everything unconditional belongs to pathology. So we are trapped in a contradiction of our profession's making. Mockery, sacred. Unconditional attachment, unconditional attachment to mockery, pathological. Leonard Cohen's great song in praise of imperfection says something similar. Ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. A crack in every ideal, a crack in every belief system, a crack in everything we hold too dear. It is essential, I believe, that we don't debase the currency. Not every whistleblower blows for the greater good. Not every secret is malign. We have no inalienable, inalienable right to know that a footballer is having an affair unless he keeps missing penalties, or unless the affair he's having is with our wife. <laughs> and even then, there's an argument for not being told. <laughs> In Human Relations, Graham Greene once wrote, kindness and lies are worth a thousand truths. The public sphere, however, is different. The public sphere requires that we be less considerate. Though even then, we are much more deadly when we pick our target and take slow and careful aim. And it matters that we are deadly. Not only when it comes to the state deceit around the world, but when it comes to our own domestic tyrannies. The tyranny of like-mindedness, sanctimony, unyielding conviction of rectitude, and the daisy chains of villainy that go with political alignment. It should not be in the name of a party or an agenda that we speak out, just skepticism. Nothing is wholly true. Nothing is wholly right. And whoever is offended when we say that deserves to be. If this were a sit-down dinner, <laughs> which it's not, I would raise a glass to that, to skepticism. And just in case you're worried about it for next time, yes, I do eat pig. Pig's brain, oyster, and chameleon bagel. Wonderful.
Ladies and gentlemen, on with, the, on with the evening. You do wonderful work. I salute you. It is the most wonderful work. You let the light in. Thank you. Howard, thank you very much for that uh, characteristically sharp, wonderfully entertaining, and extraordinarily pertinent comment on the issues of freedom of expression, which arise. I, I was, I, I, I gathered that you were rather upset about the, 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 the dinner, and I want to, you know, I do, I, I know, I, 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 I do. I want to apologise with all sincerity that um, we didn't do better, but we did do our best. It took some time, as you might imagine. I couldn't find the the chameleon, but. Um, I'd like to offer you this small bagel all by itself. <laughs> and now we come to the, those individuals to whom Howard referred a little earlier. Um, our Freedom of Expression Awards, which of course is the, the central reason why we're here this evening. Our first award is the New Media Award and supported by Google. It recognizes innovation and original use of new technology to circumvent censorship, to foster debate, argument, and dissent. Here are this year's nominees. The nominees for the Index on Censorship New Media Award, supported by Google, are TuniLeaks, NAMAT. TuniLeaks is a selection of the WikiLeaks State Department cables published by NAWAT.org, an independent group blog run by Tunisian net activists. The cables revealed corruption in so many aspects of Tunisian life. Despite attempts to block the site, News of the cables being released swiftly spread around the country. The aim is to get everyone to read, to get an idea and give meaning to the facts provided, Nawat states. The debate is open. The Tor project. Tor, a type of proxy server, enables whistleblowers, dissidents and activists to communicate safely. Designed to increase privacy and security, Internet users are able to access censored sites via a third party and conceal their browsing history. Communications via instant messaging are similarly protected. The use of Tor technology in Egypt increased fourfold in the weeks leading up to the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak, and a similar pattern was seen in Tunisia's uprising. Wen Yun Chao. Chao is a Guangdong-based internet activist. Writing for platforms including the now banned Bulog.cn, Wen established himself as one of China's best known bloggers under the alias Bei Feng. Wen now works to remove restrictions on information and champions freedom of speech. When Southern Weekly editor Chang Ping was fired in early 2011, Wen helped spread the word, organising netizens in support of Chang. He also organised Twitter's Empty Chairs event to mark Lu Xiaobo winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And, and the winner of this year's new media award is... Can we get that? Of course I do. <laughs> is, I'm going to read that, Tunis by Narot. And we have Sally Ben Gabi to come up and collect the award. everyone. Thank you very much for, for this award and for being here in this lovely place and amazing audience. Um, 
Uh, I think we, we do not deserve this, this award better than, than what Tor is doing and what our fellow uh, bloggers in China uh, are and were doing. Uh, I think access to the Tunilix uh, website was um, thanks to the great work done by, by the circumvention tool, the, the Onion Router Tor. And Tunilix um, platform is a ch actually a Chinese platform that is built on the Google AppSpot.com platform. So Tunilix is in a way a place where people who use Tor to access the platform and use a Chinese platform where they can read the cable. So in a way, Tunilix is, is an award for Tor and for our Chinese activists as well. Um, when the Le Monde, uh, the, the old established uh, newspaper, uh, started to publish the cables of the corrupted establishment in Tunisia, they didn't know that all the cables were already published by the Tunilix and they were not only published by, but translated into Arabic and English as well. And Tunilix just published the cables, put, put them into a context, but gave the opportunity to this amazing digital activist in Tunisia to put all that into context, to translate and disseminate that information on Facebook, give the information to Al Jazeera, to Earth back to Tunisia, and as a result, we've seen that the targets of Tunilix, Ben Ali, Trabelsi, uh, Shibub, all those clans of Ben Ali who corrupted Tunisia during the last two decades were the target of the Tunisian revolution. So this prize is, is very meaningful for us. It is, it is coming in the year where we are celebrating the Tunisian revolution and it's coming uh, in this year where we are celebrating the seventh year of Nawad.org existence. Thank you all. You should know that Sammy, who'd be much too modest to say so himself, um, was the other day mobbed in the Edgware Road. Um, and that's for a really very serious reason. I hope he found the, the, the experience, because he's one of the, the, the very few who stood up early on to uh, defy, and he's celebrated here and in the Middle East as a result of that. So congratulations, Sammy, and thank you. We come now to the Byman's Law and Campaigning Award. This celebrates the lawyers or campaigners who fought to protect or enhance freedom of expression. The nominees for the Bindman's Law and Campaigning Award are David Coombs. David Coombs is the criminal defence lawyer leading the defence of specialist Bradley Manning, the 23-year-old US Army intelligence analyst accused of leaking classified material to WikiLeaks. Despite Coombs' complaints, Manning has been held in solitary confinement since July 2010. Manning is subject to limits on his social contact, news consumption, ability to exercise and sleep. Coombs has used his blog to detail Manning's experiences in solitary confinement. Gao Xisheng Chinese lawyer Gao Xisheng has been persecuted by the state for speaking out on human rights issues. Gao, a self-taught lawyer, forged a career representing the underdog in cases involving medical malpractice, land redistribution, employment disputes and forced sterilisation. He has also defended journalists and religious minorities, including Christians and members of Falun Gong. Gao has been disappeared since April 2010, and the Chinese state has refused to register him as a missing person. Sherry Remen. Sherry Remen is a member of Pakistan's parliament and chair of the Jinnah Institute, a think tank committed to policies that promote fundamental rights, tolerance and pluralism. In November 2010, 
Remen submitted a bill proposing amendments to Pakistan's blasphemy law, which is routinely used to silence dissent and as a tool of intimidation against non-Muslims and members of minority Muslim sects. After the assassination of Salman Tassir by his bodyguard in January 2011, Remen was forced to withdraw her bill. And the winner of this year's Feynman's Law and Campaigning Award is Gao Xinjiang. And for very obvious reasons, he can't be here to accept the award. He is still missing. We asked his wife, Geng, to accept the award on his behalf. I hope that today I'm not the one who is standing on the stage, but the people. If that's the case, I will not be able to win him the award, and I will be able to win him the freedom, the freedom to speak, and the freedom to speak. My friend, Gao Zhishen, 他是一名人权律师，他坚定不移地站在当事人一边，尽其所能地为穷人提供免费帮助。金钱和权力诱惑不了他，邪恶和黑暗压垮不了他。不仅把律师作为一种职业，通过职业更是向大众宣传公平、正义和良知。就是这样，人民需要的好律师被中共政府剥夺了律师执照。关闭了律师事务所，监视着我们全家，直到不让女儿上学。离上一次的露面又近一年，没有任何消息。我和孩子都在担心和焦虑中度过，因为每一次的失踪伴随而来的都是骇人听闻的苦心。高深目前经历的是中国人权真实的状况。在此，我代表高志胜感谢受奖组织授予他二零一一年言论自由奖，感谢他们对高志胜律师坚守人权和自由贡献的认可。再次感谢西方自由社会对高志胜的支持，你们的支持和持续的关注是保证高志胜安全的最大保证。谢谢大家。I don't know about you, but I'm in awe of that. We come next to the Intelligent Life Arts Award. This is, a, this is a new award. It recognizes the role of the artist in facilitating diverse points of view that support or promote freedom of expression or artists facing censorship in their work. And here are this year's nominees. The nominees for the Intelligent Life Arts Award are Gurpreet Kaur Bhatti. Gurpreet Kaur Bhatti is a British Sikh playwright. Her 2004 award-winning play, Beshti, met with controversy after its depiction of sexual abuse in a Sikh temple caused offence to some members of the Sikh community. Behud, Beyond Belief, is Bhatti's response to the Beshti affair. It was staged in 2010 in Coventry in London. It is testimony to Batty's commitment to fight for her right to freedom of expression in the face of hostility. Jaff R. Panahi Iranian director Jaff R. Panahi has received international recognition for his films. In July 2009, Panahi was detained after he joined mourners at the grave of Neda Sultan, the protester who became an icon of the country's Green Revolution after she was shot dead. In December 2010, he was found guilty of colluding against the Islamic Republic and sentenced to six years in prison last December. He has also been banned from travelling and from making films for 20 years. M. F. Hussein M. F. Hussain has been battling against censorship both in his native India and abroad 
for close to 20 years. Born in 1915, he is recognised as one of India's greatest living artists. Hussain's work has caused controversy, with his depiction of Hindu gods and goddesses in the nude viewed as blasphemous and offensive. Hussain has received numerous threats and exhibitions of his work have come under attack on several occasions. In India, he has faced hundreds of legal charges relating to his work. And the winner of this Arts Award this year is M.F. Hussain from India. He is unable to be with us here, but we are very glad that Jude Kelly, the artistic director of the South Bank Centre and a patron of Index, is here and will speak and accept the award. Well, well I'm very honoured to receive this award on behalf of um, M.F. Hussein. He is a very inspirational person, a very inspirational artist, and a very inspirational fighter. He accepts, as we all do, that people have an absolute right to be able to take offence. But that right to take offence should never supersede the right to express and to have genuine artistic expression at all costs. To go into exile as an artist, which effectively he has had to do, is a terribly painful experience, but obviously it's a choice he made to prize artistic freedom above the comfort of domesticity. It's, um, it's a challenge most of us will never have to have in our own lifetime. So for his courage, I'm very honored to take this award and give it to him. Thank you. Jude, thank you very much. Um, we now come to the uh, Guardian Journalism Award. This award recognizes journalism of determination and courage. It celebrates quality, investigative journalism across the full range of media, which includes print, online, radio, and television. The, the key qualities sought for the nominations include the depth of investigation, the quality of the revelation, and the impact of the journalism. Here are this year's nominees. The nominees for the Guardian Journalism Award are Chiranuk Prem Kaiporn. Chiranuk Prem Kaiporn is the executive director of Thai news website Prachatai. She is also a founding member of Thai Netizen Network, TNN, a group which monitors violations of free speech on the internet. She is currently on trial under both the Computer Crimes Act of 2007 and laissez majesty legislation for comments critical of the monarchy posted on Prachatai. The comments were not hers, but posted by a reader, and Chironuk removed them after she was contacted by government officials. Ibrahim Issa. Egyptian editor Ibrahim Issa has been described as a one-man barometer of Egypt's struggle for political and civic freedom. Throughout his career, he has faced prosecution when his advocacy for media freedom has fallen foul of the government. When Issa was sacked from his job last year, the novelist Ala Al Aswani wrote, Ibrahim Issa did not oppose the government, he opposed the system. He called for real democratic change through free and fair elections and regular change at the top. And the winner of the Guardian Journalism Award is Ibrahim Issa.
Thank you. Thank you. جئت لكم من بلاد تنحصر خيارات الصحف الحر فيها حين يعارض الحاكم في أن يفقد الصحفي وظيفته أو يفقد حريته أو يفقد حياته وربما يفقد عقله جئت لكم من بلاد يدافع فيها الصحف الحر عن قلمه أكثر مما يكتب به يذهب إلى غرف التحقيق وقاعات المحاكم أكثر مما يذهب إلى مكتبه لكنني جئت لكم من بلاد صنعت فيها كلماتنا ثورة وتحول فيها حبرنا نهرا من البشر في مصر ظل هذا التمثال الخالد لكاتب مصري جالس القرفصاء منذ عصر الفراعنة يحرر أول مقال على وجه الأرض ظل هذا الكاتب جالسا محبوسا محاصرا في جلسته لكنه قام أخيرا في 25 يناير وبعد ستة آلاف سنة ليعلن سقوط الفرعون أشكركم على هذه الليلة العظيمة وهذا الشرف الذي سأحمله معي إلى مصر حيث سأقف في ميدان التحرير في ذلك المكان الذي مات فيه مصريون من أجل الحرية وسأقول لهم هذه جائزة اندكس أهديها لكم شكرا As you can tell, Ibrahim, you are a hero, not only at home, in your home, but to everyone anywhere who cares about what you stand for, freedom and justice. And we wish you the very best in the continuing issues and challenges that you face in this extraordinary situation that Egypt is now in. Thank you so much for coming over. Now to the stage here, two of my friends and colleagues, Chief Executive of Index, John Kampfner and Joe Glanville, who edits the magazine. They're going to come and do a double act, I think. Thank you, Jonathan. It's great to be among uh, so many supporters and so many friends. And uh, in the case of Index, that's usually the same thing. I hope you're enjoying the evening so far. At this, time, um, at this time of year, as we laud our prize winners from around the world with two absolutely inspirational figures that we're proud of to have here with us tonight, I remember what Index is for and why we are here. I'd like to thank our judges this year, David Rowan, Lindsay Hilson, Guguletu Moyu, Hans Ulrich Oberist for their expertise and their commitment to the cause of free expression, and I think you would agree for picking some very worthy winners. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been times this past year where I've had to blink. Being in Mexico, listening to the stories of regional journalists, their lives threatened, friends killed or abducted as they tried to go about their work in towns run by drugs gangs. Closer to home, standing on the stage of the Young Vic Theater, introducing, somewhat haplessly, I must admit, Syrian McKellen before a capacity audience who had come to watch the best of British actors perform with the Belarus Free Theater. And then, less theatrically, the publication, as you've heard already, of the draft defamation bill. Not perfect, yes. Much work still to be done, for sure. But a massive improvement on what we've had before. We were proud to be at the forefront of the libel reform campaign, together with our colleagues at English Pen, at Sense About Science, with a number of crucial individuals, 
Lord Leicester and the former MP, and hopefully one day again MP, Evan Harris, and others too. A campaign that persuaded this government to change a hideous law that has chilled free speech around the world. Good work with passion and professionalism, with impact and outcome. I'd like to pay tribute to Jonathan Dimbleby, who has been an exemplar of a chairman, and to our great and to our growing staff, my deputy Rohan Jayasekera, David Sewell, Emily Butzelar, Podrick Greedy, Natasha Schmidt, Mike Harris, Julia Farrington, Lizzie Rusbridger, Clara Klupata, Eve Jackson, and most recently, our new head of events, Sarah Rhodes. This has been a remarkable year for Index on Censorship, now the go-to destination for all free expression issues around the world, the morally black and white examples of oppression to the more complicated shades of gray. We've done this through our growing website with six new regional editors based in Iran, Mexico, China, Egypt, and the USA, to our international projects, our arts work, our advocacy, our conferences, and our events. And we've done it, as ever, through our award-winning magazine, whose excellent editor, as you all know, is Joe Glanville. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. I know you're not really supposed to have favourites working for an organisation like Index on Censorship, but the Middle East has always been very, very close to my heart. So this has been a particularly ex exciting year, and I'm very moved and, and thrilled to have Sami ben Garbia and Ibrahim Issa with us here tonight to make it you know, a really um, important occasion. And after all, it's about them more than it is about us. It's about the people out there who are on the front line much more than it is about us, and, and that's what we're remembering and, and honouring here tonight. Um, I'd also like to say a very big thank you to the writers. There are, there are many writers here tonight, um, I'm delighted to see, who write for the magazine and for the website. And we obviously couldn't do our work without you. Your ideas, your enthusiasm, and the immense courage that so many of our writers around the world demonstrate on a daily basis in continuing to fight for freedom of speech. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Sage, to Ziad, and, and to his colleagues who are here tonight. And they make the whole job of editing Index that much more enjoyable. And a very big thank you as well to the very talented and committed editorial team who I work with on a daily basis. There are moments when standing up for freedom of speech can test you to the very limits, whether it's the joys of dealing with the English Defence League or the particular pleasures of certain Sky Sports presenters. And I'm very lucky to work with colleagues who won't let me get away with any prejudice of any kind. Thank you. As Joe has pointed out, Index is much more than an organization. It's a cause. It's about alerting the world to the chilling effect on free expression. It's about affecting change where we can. It's about giving voice to those who would be silenced. We've done it for getting on for four decades. As someone might have said, traditional values in a modern setting. A number of events and publications online and offline will mark our 40th anniversary next year. And we will invite all of you and many more besides to be part of that, to be partners, to be patrons of Index at 40. We could have done none of this over the years without our funders. Their commitment to our values and to our work is inestimable. We would like to thank them. Shortly, we'll have one final award for the evening, the special category, category with deserving winners to be introduced by Sir Tom Stoppard. But before that, it's time for you to do something. You'll have lots of fun too, I promise you. So when the time comes, please raise your hand, bid high and higher still. Yes, it's time for the auction. We have the most incredible prizes this year. Enormous thanks to those who have donated and to those who have brought in those prizes and those donations. So please welcome your auctioneer, Nick Stewart. Now, a lot of you have supported, a lot of you want to support 
indexes work. Some of you have done it just now. I'm quite certain that all of you would like to be able to support. Now, you have the opportunity to do just that now. You've got a pledge card. You've already heard that merely by filling in your email address, you get a, f a free subscription for a year to index the magazine. Um, I absolutely do not need to, but I might just for a second remind us why we exist. We exist to protect, we've seen some of the names there, some of the individuals, we've got two of them here. Those individuals who fight for things that many of us take for granted. There is nothing without freedom of expression. There's death in life if you don't have freedom of expression. It's absolutely critical. Index really does play an important part in helping achieve those objectives, highlighting those who fight for those objectives, seeking to help those who suffer for their fight for those objectives. So, I'm gonna ask you um, to pledge. You can see on the form the, the variety of what you can pledge. Now, I, I wanna ask, this is a real risk, I want to ask just a question of you, which you can answer by a show of hands. Who would like to pledge this evening a certain amount of money? Would you just put your hand up if you would like to pledge to index a certain amount of money? I'm not asking you for what amount. All I want is a show, one hand or two hands to go up. I've got one, two, three. Who, who, who wants to pledge? I can see quite a lot of hands up. Who wants to pledge but is slightly embarrassed to admit it in public? <laughs> that seems to be a lot more anyway. I'm going to give us about 10 seconds now, 15 seconds, just to write your name in there, get a copy of the magazine, and pledge, and then we will, then we will move on. And in fact, we'll move on to an example of exactly why you will want to pledge. The... The last award that we have is a special award. It's a special commendation to Belarus's prisoners of conscience that I referred to at the very beginning. This is a, now we can see, a summary of the reasons why the prisoners of conscience have been given this award. Index on Censorship is honoured to give a special commendation to Belarus's prisoners of conscience. On the 19th of December, the night of the presidential elections in Belarus, a large demonstration was held in Independence Square in Minsk. The protest was dispersed violently, with the arrest of around 700 people. Those held were treated appallingly. Natalia Koliada, the co-founder of the Belarus Free Theatre was one of those arrested. The Free Theatre had performed at an event organised by Index on Censorship just two weeks previously at the Young Vic. Whilst Koliada was in prison, guards made vile threats. You're animals. We want to kill you. Our dream is to kill you. Those detained were not held in cells, but had to stand in freezing prison corridors. All the prisoners had biometric photographs taken of them and were fingerprinted and filmed. Alice Mikhailovich, one of seven presidential candidates who was detained, has subsequently made serious allegations of torture. In total, 42 people face criminal prosecutions for organising a mass disturbance. The charges carry a prison sentence of up to 15 years. Now can I ask, we've been waiting for him, Sir Tom Stoppard to come up and speak and then give this award. Tom. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Um, please do allow me to say first how much it means to me to be representing the magazine Index on Censorship for a few moments. 
The magazine has been a good deed in a wiki world for a long time. I've known it and admired it, I think, from the beginning. And I was once, indeed, for a period, uh, a member of its uh, board of trustees. Uh, we are grateful to it, and we respect it, and we hope it has a long and happy and healthy future, which I'm sure it does. Um, my Scottish friend has told you everything that I was going to say about this award, and I'm very grateful to him, but I think you've now got the facts. Um, I perhaps should mention that um, I know some of just a few of these 42 I, I met when I was in Minsk five years ago, and um, I'm close to um, some small group of people who represent the recipients who are with us today, members of the Belarus Free Theatre. I got an email out of the blue from people I didn't know, I think in 2005, and it simply asked for a message of support for their work. And it didn't seem to me to be very much to ask, so I got around to asking them what they really wanted, and I ended up meeting them, and I've known them ever since. And although they don't say much about it themselves, in their own way, they represent a quality which is deeply present in the 42 who are incarcerated and who are indeed the representative, the, the recipients of this special commendation award. And that attribute is courage, sheer simple courage. Uh, it's something that few of us have cause or necessity to show in ourselves. Um, well, I won't speak for all of you, I cannot. I know some of the people who are here. Uh, for myself, I feel that I've had a charmed life and um, there's a balance to be made between mine and other people's. And if you feel that about your own life, then um, it's not that difficult to just adjust that balance for yourselves in one, any one of innumerable ways. So there are 42 people, they're either in the KGB cells or under house arrest, and it was mentioned uh, much, much earlier that there were 42 arrested. Um, in fact, these are the remaining 42 of several hundred who were arrested on the evening when there was a peaceful demonstration against, well, it's all received knowledge, but um, I'm prepared to pledge myself for it, so I will continue a protest and a demonstration against an evidently unfair rigged election, which presented the country again with a dictator. And I would like to just add that perhaps we all need jogging in some way because um, it's a fact so grotesque that perhaps we're too close to it to recognize it. But here is an anomaly, um, a good old-fashioned copper-bottomed, no-nonsense-about-it, bloody dictatorship on our doorstep in Europe, two hours from London, adjacent to Poland, Lithuania. I mean, it's just sitting there being a dictatorship at a time and place where we sort of vaguely accept the almost truth that such things in Europe have been consigned to history. And it is galling and salutary to be reminded on such an occasion as this that although it should have been consigned to history, all the stigmata of dictatorship are very much present today. March 24th, 2011, there it is, the whole deal. Imprisonment for turning up at a peaceful protest, indiscriminate and savage beatings by policemen, incarceration without contact with lawyers, lawyers intimidated for attempting to do their task. I really um, could keep you for 40 minutes. I'm going to wrap this 
um, because the person whom I'd really like you to meet is not myself. Um, it is Natalia, uh, Natalia Colliado, who is herself only one of others, but here she is. Um, she's an indomitable spirit. Um, I'm humbled to be in this position of privilege to present her with the Special Commendation Award of the magazine Index on Censorship. And you look remarkably well after all the things I've been saying about the life you've been leading. Um, and here's the microphone, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know whether you know that uh, and whether Tom likes it, but he's our third father because nobody takes care of us as he does and Irina and another friend of us in uh, London and Jackie Matthews. These are the people who are taking care of us. But uh, I just want to tell you about our relations with Index before. I go to my uh, story. And you know, when I'm appearing on stage, it, it means that the evening is destroyed. I would just start to complain. So before I start to complain, I just tell you our story uh, about our relations. Because um, uh, last week, I sent my speech to Mike Harris. He said I need it. So uh, I was flying to Washington. I prepared, I sent it. Uh, today I got back to London from Washington and I got email from Mike saying, you know what, it should be shorter uh, and uh, you, you, your speech is the longest one. So uh, it means that our relations got to this amazing, fantastic uh, frame of friendship. Uh, actually, it was started from our meeting with Julia Farrington. I think she is somewhere upstairs, our amazing, absolutely friend. And then it came to uh, um, Jonathan Dimbley, who presented us in Janvik before the elections. And it's coming to Monday when John Comfer would be speaking to us at the protest, I believe so, and hope so for this, with a great support. Um, against British business taking place in Belarus. So this is our amazing relations with the uh, index. But uh, I just, when Mike sent me this today, he marked that each page is one and a half minutes. Uh, and it means that pay attention to your time. So I'm already speaking for two minutes, I'm sure. But because I'm the last one, and you are here, I'll be speaking. Um, on the midnight of December 19, 2010, a 12-year-old girl was walking down the main avenue of Minsk, of city, together with her father back home. The streets were empty and there were no people. There were a lot of snow and a big Christmas tree with many lights on. And the girl said to her dad, I have a feeling that there will be no New Year family dinner this time. It was the day of presidential election when people went to a peaceful rally. There was a feeling that this new year would be the best one for the last 16 years. But that night, the snow absorbed a lot of blood. There were boots and shoes all over the main squares. Many people had been severely injured, beaten up, humiliated, arrested, and thrown into jail. Over 700 were arrested that evening. That night I was in the square. I ran Natalia Radina, editor-in-chief of one of the most influential websites, charter97.org, to tell her details on what happened. Natalia was severely injured, she said, concussion, but she didn't go to hospital. She wanted to update Charter 97 website to tell the world what's happening in Belarus. Her office was raided, the team was arrested at three o'clock in the morning, as it happened to other independent media as National Niva, European Radio, and others. Last year, Natalia Radina was nominated for Index on Censorship Award. She came to London for the ceremony. Afterwards, she said she knew that there are other people who deserve the award more, but she wanted more people to talk about Belarus as it deserved the same attention that other countries get to face similar problems as ours. One year has passed since that moment, but everything has changed 
thing that day in London. On September 3, my cars from Index on Censorship arrived to Minsk to see our performances and to meet all our friends. Instead of meetings, he attended the funeral. Our, sorry. Is there any water somewhere? <clears throat> but I, I think I would manage. Our very close friend, Oleg Bibenin, founder of Charter 97. Um, our very close friend, Oleg Bibenin, founder of Charter 97 website, was found dead. It was just the beginning of what happened on December 19, 2010. Now Lukashenko wants to repeat what he did in 1999. He wants to remove all leaders of Belarus but use a new method. As he said at his press conference right after the crankdown on December 20, he will not make presence to the opposition as disappearances. That should give the moment when the world stops talking to the last dictator of Europe. This is the person who kidnaps, kills people, put innocent people in jail and use them for blackmail. Generally, such people are put on trial, but somehow the world doesn't apply this to Lukashenko. Belarus is one of the main five countries that traded arms. Today, when the UK and France fight for human rights in Libya, they are fighting with Gaddafi, who bought arms from Lukashenko. It's necessary to understand that the last dictatorship in Europe put in danger the whole world, not just its own people. Nevertheless, the West continued to engage this monster. Monster, human rights and democracy took second place to geopolitical interest, business profits and historical fears of Russia. It was five minutes past midnight of the 1st of January of 2011. We have crossed the border of Belarus. And it was first time in my life when we didn't have a family dinner. It was my 12-year-old daughter who said to my husband that she has a feeling that there will be no year dinner this time. For many people in Belarus, there was no New Year dinner. There are six people who were main opponents, journalists and business, and they were killed. For today, not 42 people face 15 years in jail. It's already 56. To date, Natalia Radina, who stayed in KGB jails for 40 days, was transferred to her hometown. Her passport was taken from her. She needs to be checked by local KGB and police. Now she faces up to 15 years in jail, yet she continues her job as a journalist for Charter 97 together with Fyodor Pavluchenko and Pavel Marinj and great team who are still underground in Belarus. Does the world need to wait for people to be killed in Belarus, in the streets, as it's happened in Libya, or it might be a good idea to free Belarus now? People who do independent media, they put themselves at risk, but they knew it's important to inform the world about what happened on December 19 in Belarus. And I'm joined today by Irina Bogdanova, Sanikova, sister of Andrei Sanikov, the presidential candidate, and sister-in-law of Irina Khalif, a famous journalist who is today accused by the last dictator for trying to overthrow him, and Elena Edwards, who is sister-in-law of Alice Mikhailovich. Irina and Elena represent all relatives of those people who are in jails, past tortures and humiliation, stay under house arrest, the world politicians have said all the right things to us, but they lack courage to stand up and take actions against Lukashenko. So 
we have decided to take actions ourselves. And today, these two ladies present here, and I would like Irina and Elena to come up to here because this is the award is to prisoners, political prisoners of Belarus. And these two ladies who start private persecution against the last dictator in Europe. This award belonged to all political prisoners. It's belonged to people who are killed and kidnapped in Belarus and who stand up for human rights in Belarus now. of days ago. Um, I'm touched and humbled by the honor of receiving this award on, the, on behalf of our friends and loved ones. And I'm extremely grateful to all of you for the support you're giving us and for all the help uh, that Index and Censorship is doing to help us to free our loved ones. And I, one of the slogans of my brother's campaign was, together we will win. And I'm appealing to you to join us in our fight for freeing our relatives and, and friends. Together we will win. Thank you very much. the applause and you know exactly what that means Irina and Natalia too you did overrun your time it was worth every single moment of it it's a privilege for all of us to have heard exactly what you said and what you three represent and you've paused made us pause to think of those 52 who now face 15 years in jail for daring to demonstrate um, I said you overrun. You wouldn't have got to where you are now if you obeyed, would you? <laughs> Thank God for disobedience. Um, I also want to say thank you to, to, to Tom, Tom Stoppard, for, for saying what he said with such a brilliance and eloquence. The master writer, playwright of repression, oppression, torture, and misery, and done in a way that stirs every heart between the smiles. Thanks very much, Tom, for being here and for speaking for us. Now, that, that really is it. Keep in touch with website, with Index through the website. Hand in the pledges, those of you who have pledged, and I hope there'll be more after what you've just heard. There'll be people to pick them up outside. Hope you've enjoyed the evening. Let us know what you think of it, because we can always improve what we seek to achieve. Um, there is a glass of wine there and something to eat in the form of a sweet, so join us outside for a drink and something to eat. To you all, thank you so much for coming. Good night. Thank you.